district released a statement asking parents to talk to their children about how they're feeling as they cope with this unexpected loss. Turning now to Utah's Capitol Hill, the second week of the 2023 Utah legislative session, nearly in the books. Today, a controversial bill getting final legislative approval. Senate Bill 16 limiting transgender procedures and some medical treatments to kids and teens. ABC4 reporter Kate Garner joining us from Capitol Hill. And Kate, there's a very mixed response to this bill today. That's right. Members of the LGBTQ plus community, including transgender people, are speaking out against Senate Bill 16 as lawmakers and supporters of this bill say this decision is all about the kids. I'll say from my heart and the heart of everybody I know here on the Hill, whether they agree with this bill or not, compassion and love are at the base of all of this. Senator Michael Kennedy is the bill's sponsor. The bill allows young adults to file a malpractice suit against health care providers if they decide they didn't consent to treatment as a child. The individual had to suffer a permanent physical injury to prove malpractice. Those in opposition arguing that passing the bill emboldens anti-transgender rhetoric within the state, like Senator Jen Plum, who has a transgender daughter. In general, these are kiddos who already feel in some ways outside or othered. Um, and this is, is hard messaging. Previously, I thought of it as like, God, maybe they don't have to grow up with that. Lorcan Murphy is a transgender woman and wasn't able to begin her transition until after puberty. It feels like watching yourself kind of like turn into a monster. She is saddened by the passing of the bill. So is emergency medical physician and transgender woman, Taylor Delgado. It's going to increase demand for telehealth services. It's going to increase demand for out-of-state care, but it's not going to change who these kids are. Children and teens who have been receiving treatment for gender dys dysphoria for at least six months will be exempt from the things that are put into place because of this bill, the pause on treatment. Now, the bill heads to the governor's office for his consideration, and he has already said that he doesn't plan on vetoing it. Reporting live in Salt Lake City, Kate Garner, ABC4 News. All right. Thank you, Kate, for keeping track of that. Two other bills regulating transgender expression in the legislature this session. Today, a bill requiring schools to tell parents if their child's use different names or pronouns in the classroom passing through. A House committee 11 to 0 with just a minor adjustment to language. The new substitute will go back to the Senate if it passes through the House. New at 5, a new abortion bill would add more restrictions to Utah's trigger law. As it stands, Utah law bans abortion outright, except in some cases like rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother. But Representative Kara Berkland's proposed Victim Services Amendments bill would cut back the time frame that rape and incest victims can get an abortion from up until birth to 18 weeks. The bill also adds provisions like free counseling for victims, health care coverage during pregnancy, and for one year of the baby's life, and improving sexual assault training for law enforcement. And a refinery that extracts magnesium from the Great Salt Lake is getting blamed for causing some of Utah's bad air. Newly released findings from a 2017 study on winter air pollution finds the U.S. magnesium refinery southwest of the Great Salt Lake emits 10 to 25 percent of the fine air particles that form the massive inversion cloud hanging over the valley in the winter. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration conducted the research. We reached out to U.S. magnesium refinery for comment on the study, but have not yet heard back. Time now for a first look at the weather forecast with Chief Meteorologist Lana Brophy. Who is outside on the porch, Shalana? Hi, friends. Yeah, we've got cloud cover, but quiet conditions in Salt Lake County. We've got clean air right now in Salt Lake as well and along the Wasatch Front, and that's because we've got snow systems impacting us. And that live look in Cache Valley, which I'm going to show you, has the snow coming down just at 700 north. It's noticeable there. And they woke up in Cache Valley with snow and cold temperatures overnight allowed that to accumulate. You notice that road snow and slush on your screen there. When we look at the totals thus far, that first wave bringing more than two inches to the Wasatch back, 1.8 in Richmond, close to an inch there in Salt Lake, and then half an inch in Kaysville. So across the board, light accumulations, but we're not done. Nope, not yet. As we take a look at the storm tracker radar, it is sweeping the area and it gives you a really good idea of where we're seeing mixed precipitation. So some rain coming down with snow due to the temperatures, and then where we're seeing snow that's up there on I 15 towards Brigham City. And you watch that goes all the way down to the Ogden Valley as well as over near Logan. Now, 
Now, why are we seeing mixed precipitation or rain? Well, it's our temperatures, our northerly flow backing off just a little bit because of this system. So it's more northwesterly, which is allowing for the numbers. We made it to 40 in Salt Lake to be a little warmer above the freezing point in several locations and temperatures in the upper 40s down there in St. George. Our winter weather advisory that was in effect for the northern Wasatch, well, that holds on as we get through noon tomorrow, but it has been expanded, yet now includes the entire Wasatch range as well as the Wasatch back. Again, holding on through tomorrow afternoon. We've got to talk accumulations and what to expect coming up in my full forecast in just a few moments. Glenn, Emily, back to you. All right, thank you, Alana. Well, in Salt Lake County, the former Murray mayor, known for his lengthy mustache, gaining attention for something else, allegedly spitting on a stranger during a bout of road rage. Former Mayor Dan Snar charged yesterday with a Class A misdemeanor. According to his victim, Snar cut him off while he was leaving a gas station in September, and he flipped him off and drove away, saying the former mayor followed him. They both pulled over, and that's when Snar allegedly got out of his car and confronted the other driver before spitting on him. Snar told police he just coughed and it's possible some spit ended up on the man's car. We'll hear from Dan Snar coming up tonight at 10. New developments in the violent attack on the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Video released today showing different moments leading up to that assault. David DePap is allegedly seen using a hammer to break through a glass door to Pelosi's San Francisco home where he found Pelosi's husband Paul. Police say DePap tried to tie him up but Paul managed to call police. You know, this, this gentleman just uh, came into the house uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. When I left my house, I left to go fight Jeremy. I did not leave to go surrender. Responding off. A member of a public official. And in national news, more national news, Washington is also weighing in on the death of Tyree Nichols. President Joe Biden, who spoke directly with Nichols' mother and stepfather this afternoon, now renewing calls for federal police reform. DC, Washington, D.C.'s Raquel Martin has more from Capitol Hill. Leaders across Washington are appalled by the deadly beating of Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis police. Deeply disturbing. Distressing. Tragic. As both federal and local law enforcement investigate, President Joe Biden is demanding Congress also act by passing federal police reforms. We must have accountability when law enforcement officers violate their oath. Friday, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said Nichols' death underscores the need for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. That bill would update policing standards nationwide and require other officers intervene when they witness excessive force. Uh, we shouldn't be, be reliving this type of uh, hurt and pain. Police reform legislation, however, remains a divisive issue on Capitol Hill. Self-proclaimed moderate South Carolina Republican Nancy May says she wants that to change. We have real problems in this country and we need to focus on real solutions. That means Republicans and Democrats coming to the table to keep our, the good police in their jobs and keep our communities safe. Democrats like Texas Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee say they're not giving up on reforms. It's Congress's responsibility to now have a consistent policy to help police departments across America recruit the right kind of people and make sure that in this nation of law and order, that every person's life is worthy. Speaker Kevin McCarthy has not said if he will reopen police reform negotiations. In Washington, Raquel Martin. Thank you, Raquel. A University of Utah law professor in a Texas courtroom yesterday representing families who say Boeing is responsible for the deaths of their loved ones. The aerospace giant settled with the Justice Department last year, agreeing to pay $2.5 billion in the deaths of 346 passengers in two 737 jet crashes. But law professor Paul Cassell rejects the deal, saying relatives were illegally kept in the dark. Some family members of the passengers killed got to tell their story of loss before the plane maker pled not guilty to a fraud charge that they were aware of the model's flawed design. Maybe everything Boeing is doing is fine, but maybe it's not. And the consequences of them not doing what's right are too catastrophic to imagine. It's not yet clear whether today's action could reopen the settlement. Still ahead, bringing back an old West tradition to modern day Utah, how sheriff's posses are still making their rounds in Summit County. And the snow is coming down on the Wasatch back. Live look at Liberty, where we've got light snow. Ogden Valley going to definitely pick up accumulations as we roll through tomorrow. Other spots along the Wasatch front will as well. Where? 
Answers coming up in Utah's most accurate forecast. You're watching ABC4 News, celebrating 75 years. An Old West tradition still alive and well here in Utah today. Not long ago, a sheriff sergeant helped bring a posse full of horses and deputies back to Summit County. ABC4's Brian Carlson shows us how they saddle up when duty calls. In tonight, it's behind the badge report. When you think about the backcountry in Summit County, there's a lot of rugged mountain terrain, and that gives sheriff's deputies a lot of ground to cover. Much easier to do on horseback than your own two feet. Making a five day journey in three days. Forming a sheriff's posse isn't something you just see in the movies. It's real Western life for Summit County Sheriff Sergeant Jeremy Foreman. He rides horseback for the county's mounted patrol. That's by far the highlight in my career. Foreman helped form the county's current sheriff's posse you see today. Trained to handle intense situations. Respond on search and rescues or trot through a parade. For whatever reason, that horse breaks down those barriers between the police and the public. They want to interact with the horse, they want to visit with the police because we're horseback. And that's not something that we get when we're in our patrol cars. Sheriff Foreman has done other notable things. In 2014, he won the Utah Sheriff's Association's Deputy of the Year for his work with police canines and now oversees the county school resource officers for three school districts. There we go. There, see, look at that. All right. But Foreman says he's had moments with the posse he feels couldn't have come any other way. Last fall, he credits the posse for a miracle, searching for a missing hunter they'd given up on in the dark. We were riding through the trees, and I actually looked over, and we, we could see a light. We decided, well, we better ride over there and at least check it out. We were hollering for this guy, and pretty soon he hollered back. And we were, I mean, within 100 yards of it. From that time that he answered us until we located him, got him out of there, the light was gone. So I don't know where the light came from or what the light was. I'm telling you, we rode to the light, and that was where the guy was. And he didn't have one. 
So whether it's witnessing something he can't explain or simply seeing people's special relationship with the posse, Foreman feels having these horses is just as valuable today as it was in the Old West. Now I asked Foreman if he's just an old cowboy at heart. And he says he's not a cattle guy, so you can't call him a cowboy, but John Wayne isn't that far off. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Well, in Heber City, a unique winter sport makes its way back to Utah, calling back to the days of the wild, wild west. Yeah, have you heard of this? It's called ski joring, and it combines horses, skis, and an obstacle course. So here's how it works. One person riding a horse drags along a skier who's connected by a rope. The trio horse, horseback rider, and skier then clear gates and jumps while the rider throws rings and, of course, they're trying to go as fast as they can. This weekend's competition open to all who would like to compete. Races kicking off this afternoon and continue through tomorrow. Time now for Utah's most accurate forecast with Alana Brophy. Weather rates certified 11 years in a row. I call I don't want to be the skier. Okay. No? No. See, out, of the three of us, out of the three of us, who's doing ski joring and who's doing it well? Go. Are you skiing? <laughs> I'll, I'll be on the horse. I, I'm down. I'll give it a try. I feel like <laughs> You would be solid, but I feel like I could take you. I know that's terrible. Maybe right. it's Friday. Maybe the it's I'll be the right Friday field. It's on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> wow, that just looks like fun, and we're going to have fresh snow if people do want to go ski joring as we roll through the weekend. Not the case down there in St. George where it's beautiful. So I know if you're dealing with the cloud cover in the north, goodness, just soak in the beauty of Washington County. St. George sitting at 50 degrees, the red rock popping, but you know what? They're going to get cold. I'll tell you when because this system coming through. The next one, really going to pack a punch. Live look at Hiram. We've seen fresh snow in Cache Valley in the last 12 hours. That's going to continue with snow falling right now in the northern portion of the state. You can see Cache Valley dealing with some light snow on the radar here. That extends into the Ogden Valley. What you're seeing in pink, that's mixed precipitation. As the radar sweeps, it gives you an idea that it's rain and snow. So as the snow comes down, it turns to rain because we've got temperatures above average on the valley floor. That's in and around Salt Lake County and over towards Tooele. But we know backside of the Wasatch dealing with snow. Heber up towards Morgan as well as Huntsville. And those are areas that are now under that winter weather advisory. It's been extended to include the Wasatch back. It holds until noon tomorrow, so the times have been adjusted on this as well. We're talking about accumulation, and it's really going to move through for the overnight and into tomorrow morning. So your Saturday is going to be soggy if you're in the northern half of the state. Different story down south, but then another storm on the way. Temperatures in the 30s and 40s. Salt Lake sitting at 40 degrees, and as a result of that, we get rain, but we've got colder air on the way. Eastern side of state, poor Vernal. The basin is just so socked in. They really have cold air trapped on the valley floor. They've seen an extended period of inversion. Freeze in Moab, 30s for the I-15 corridor right now into tonight. We're going to cool things off, get a little chilly, and then next week, oh, you have to see these numbers. Okay, this evening, scattered snow showers, they're out there, they're going to continue. That's going to be the case into the overnight, and you see how that kind of sags a little further south into the central portion of Utah. Don't rule out the I-70 corridor near Richfield. You guys could see some showers as well as over towards Castle Country and Nephi. Tomorrow will be similar to today, where we're unsettled for the northern half of the state. A few more clouds down there in southern Utah. But really, the action stays up north, but we do see snow showers. We get a bit of a break as we get later into the day, and then here comes Sunday. This storm, it's got a strong cold front. It is packing a punch, and it's going to bring more snow to northern Utah, but it looks like a statewide storm as that front will sweep further south and impact the southern portion of the state. Let's start, though, with snow totals for tomorrow. Because when all is said and done with these showers, we do have the potential for accumulation one to four inches for our Wasatch Valleys. That includes the Wasatch Front, Wasatch Back at four to eight, and our mountains, which you can see here as you look at the legend, Wasatch, Uintas, the Bear River Range, they're going to get the healthiest totals. Eight to 14, I think we could see mountains for the Wasatch Range. The southern end could be closer to half a foot, so six inches there. After we deal with the snow, we open the door for this very cold air. Arctic air comes flooding into the state, and Monday and Tuesday, we're going to be way below average, so we've got very chilly conditions on the way. We wanted to warn you, give you a heads up, just so you know, you're going to need the heavier snow coat because it is going to be chilly. Okay, 30s. We zoom in. Find your city. Notice we've got our mountain valleys in the 20s and mid-30s for tomorrow. That's pretty close to where we should be this time of year. A mix of 30s in central Utah. Southern Utah has a warming trend through Sunday, and then boom, Monday, they get hit with that system. Comes through, the timing of it opens the door for some mixed precipitation in Washington County. We actually see that storm first, and you notice those active skies hold on through Monday, and then, whoa, we dry out. And everyone says, I don't want any more snow, but I feel like you'd opt for snow when you have a high of 23. Over the cold. 
cold? Yeah. I mean, oh. I would take snow. I mean, I'm not so much worried about drying out as I am warming up. <laughs> I, it's going to take several days because yeah. that cold snap lasts. So, wow. yeah. Wow. All right. Chilly. Thank you, Alana. Yeah. Time now for Liquid Sports with Dana Green. And with the All Star game, it's only right that we have a local player on the roster, right? You would right? hope. You yeah. would hope. You know, the All Star starters were announced yesterday. The reserves will be announced next Thursday. And we are all certainly hoping that Lowry Marketing hears his name called. At the beginning of the year, hardly anyone thought Marketing could develop into an All Star. In his first year with the Jazz, but he is having by far the best season of his five year career. Markinen's averaging almost 25 points per game while shooting an incredible 52% from the field. He has the numbers to be an all star. The question is are the coaches who pick the reserves paying attention to his numbers? The players sure are. In fact, it was revealed that Markinen received 73 votes from the players to be an all star starter. That was the fourth most by a Western Conference front court player behind just the three starters at age 25 and now in his sixth NBA season marketing has developed into one of the top players in the league and he says he appreciates the recognition from his peers I mean it feels good uh, to get that but same time I mean don't really look too much into it I feel like we'd go worry about today and work, the work continues so obviously the top three only Really counts, but it feels good to ha know that there's players who we obviously play against every day. So they they've been seeing that. So uh, yeah, that makes it a little bit better. Jazz host Dallas tomorrow. The Utah basketball team was picked to finish. 10th in the Pac-12 this season. Well, 11 games into the conference schedule, Utah's tied for second. The running Utes made it three straight wins last night with another dominant wire-to-wire -wire victory over Oregon State, the third straight game in which the Utes never trailed. Utah led by 16 at the half. Brandon Carlson fought through some foul trouble, scored 12. The Utes getting all the bounces in this one. Lazar Stevanovich hits the three. Utah led by as many as 31. Raleigh Wooster, what a season he's having. 12 points, 7 assists, 6 rebounds last night. Oregon State missed their first 14 three-pointers of the game. They were awful. And Utah wins at 63-44. Their last three wins have been by an average of 19 points, and they are rolling heading into tomorrow's showdown at Oregon. I just think, you know, with all the preseason stuff and everyone's opinions, I think we just use this uh, fuel to the fire. Um, you know, we just go out and play hard and uh, see what happens. You know, we always believe in ourselves from our coaches to our players and everyone in our staff uh, in our program. I think that's huge for us, you know, whether guys are struggling or playing great. You know, we always have that belief behind us and confidence in ourselves. The media picked them to finish 10th. What do they know? <laughs> they don't know anything. They're 8-3 and three in the Pac-12, just a half game behind UCLA. Tough game at yes. Oregon tomorrow. And coming up at 6, good news for the Utes football team as a key player is coming back. We'll tell you about that. Mm, that's I'm a surprised tease. to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Okay, thank quiet. you, Dana. Until 6. Until 6. We'll be right back. <laughs>